Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend a few minutes with Dune by Frank Herbert. This book was originally published back in 1965, and I listened to a 2006 audio renaissance version of Dune. So I decided to, to give this another go. I, I read Dune originally more than 25 years ago, and there's a, there's a new movie adaptation uh, that uh, was directed by Denis Villeneuve, and its release, I believe, has been delayed until 2021 due to the pandemic. But watching the trailer for that adaptation really piqued my interest in the Dune series again. And I have read one of the other uh, novels in the Dune series, but I can't remember which one. It was so long ago. So I decided I would read... Um, the, the the six of the Frank Herbert novels. Um, there are some additional novels that have been published in this universe um, that were written by um, Frank Herbert's son, Brian, I believe, as well as uh, collaborating with another, another writer. So, but I at least wanted to read, you know, the six. Uh, so I decided to start off with uh, the first book in the series again, since it's been so long since I read it. So I'm going to be really careful in this chat to not give away any kind of information that I think would detract from a first-time reader of Dune. Um, so I'm going to be careful about that. But just to sort of describe the main characters in the book, so the book, um, the main character is really Paul Atreides. So we have the Atreides family. They're a noble family that live on a planet called Caladan. They are humans. This is the far human future, many thousands of years in our future. They live on a planet called Caladan, which is a, an ocean wet world. But um, the politics of the day uh, are such that Paul's father, the Duke, Duke Leto, is uh, going to take possession of a planet called Arrakis, which is a desert planet. It's the Dune planet. So Arrakis is a very important planet, though, due to a natural resource that occurs only on Arrakis, and this is called Melange, or the Spice. And Spice is a um, it's a product that is mined or is found only on Arrakis, and it actually um, has lots of like fantastic properties. Namely, it can change our consciousness and make us um, be able to see into the future, to um, be able to... It really just is mind expansive. And so the interesting thing about this world politically is that... Um, there are no there are no thinking machines, you know. So we learn that uh, machines have been outlawed. So what this has um, meant for humanity for the humans is that they've had to develop their own skills, and one of the ways that they do this is through this spice melange. And so um, we have the Atreides family. We have the sort of the opposite family, which is the Harkonnens, they um, and the Atreides family are the main rivals. And then there is an emperor who is another force, uh, political force that uh, comes into play in this novel. Then we have a couple of other kind of groups as far as power brokers, and that is the guild. The guild controls the movement. The, so if you're in faster than light travel, if you're in space, right, traveling from planet to planet, and you don't have thinking machines, you have to have some way to be able to do the calculations, right, and to understand, have the prescience, you know, to be able to see enough into the future that you can figure out um, the, the faster than light path as just using your own human brain and so the guild does this um there are these sort of superhuman type of of people well they're not really superhuman but they're called mentats and they are um humans who have been sort of genetically engineered to have greater computing power and then they also use um you know the spice at least the guild in the guild um then to make the calculations necessary for transportation and so the guild controls all the transportation then there's this organization a religious organization it's run by women it's called the Bene Gesserit and so the Bene Gesserit are a group 
group that have been around for thousands of years and they practice a form of religious engineering as well as genetic engineering of the genetic engineering really of the noble houses and um, as well as um, sowing the seeds of mythologies all around in the different worlds that then they can use in the future you know to their advantage. So Paul Atreides in the Atreides family his mother is a concubine of Duke Leto and her name is the Lady Jessica and she is a member of this order called the Bene Gesserit. And so she has uh, typically she was instructed by the Bene Gesserit to bear the Duke a daughter which is their typical way of um, sort of um, continuing on their line, but she uh, disobeyed and bore him a son, Paul. Um, so Paul takes on a whole different religious and sort of power role within this novel. So, um, yeah, um, the some of the ideas that I had around the book, though, um, th there's a, there's a, there's a, the main book, the, the main kind of point of this book, I think, is this struggle between the, the Harkonnens and the Atreides. So as I mentioned, the Atreides are going to leave Caladan, their sort of wet world, um, and then they're going to move to Arrakis, which is a desert world. And um, so they do this right at the very, very beginning of the novel. There are some native people who live on this desert world. They're called Fremen. And the Fremen have adapted to life on this desert world. They have their own mythology. They have a rather um, sort of... Um, stark kind of austere way of living obviously where their main value is water and so they they uh, value everything in terms of water and so water is uh, very much rationed they also wear these things called still suits which are these suits that they have to wear that traps their water and recycles it sort of like you would do in space right and so the Fremen are very knowledgeable about life on Arrakis. And so eventually Paul and the Fremen do inter interact, um, you know, quite a bit. The, the Fremen have earlier in um, history had um, a contact with the Bene Gesserit who have the Bene Gesserit have actually seeded some mythology among them. Um, and, you know, then they start recognizing Paul as uh, this sort of uh, leader figure that they have been waiting on in their mythology. So another thing I wanted to say about the spice on Arrakis, so it, it exists on Arrakis only, as I mentioned, and there are these giant worms called sandworms that figure really fairly prominently in this first novel, uh, and I think throughout subsequent ones, but um, they are... Um, they are in the desert. They're very dangerous. And so a person not only has to, they have to, you have to be very careful when you're walking because they can hear you coming. And so, you know, I think a lot of other science fiction have borrowed from a lot of these concepts that are in Dune. Um, and so we have seen this, uh, this sort of um, myth, this sort of idea of, of these creatures that can hear you in the desert uh, play out through some other uh, works of science fiction that I won't go into here. Um, but so some uh, some thoughts I had about the book as far as like just sort of things I've taken away from it and it really made me think about was like what would we do if we decided to 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 actually just reject our machines our thinking machines because especially I think now you know in our current society where we have become so attached to our smartphones, etc., and social media where we're connected to it all the time and it's impacting our brain. So, you know, their their um their thought was that machines actually caused humanity to degrade um and to degenerate. And so the reason one of the reasons they got rid of their machines was to prevent this. And instead of uh, relying on the machines, the humans were forced then to um to evolve themselves. And so to me, that's really sort of an interesting, um, interesting idea that, uh, you know, this wholesale rejection, they don't reject knowledge, they reject artificial, the artificial attainment of knowledge, or what they consider to be the artificial attainment of knowledge. And then another kind of thing that I thought about a lot after finishing up this first uh, novel in the series is this loyalty through love versus loyalty through fear. So loyalty through love. So there's a, there's, there's a 
lot of loyalty in this book. This book has a kind of a medieval, you know, not really Roman. We do have an emperor, but to me it felt really kind of more medieval with the dukes and the lords. And then there's all these noble houses. So the noble houses plus re a re the religious institution um, and the guilds kind of run everything. So to me that has kind of a medieval power structure. But there's different ways, there's different loyalties. So there's loyalty to through love. So the Atreides, they're their people in their uh, sort of in their orbit love them because they they just they love them because they love they feel valued and they feel loved. The Harkonnens, on the other hand, this other house, this other powerhouse, um, they also have loyalty in their orbit, but it's due to fear uh, because they rule very harshly and very cruelly, and so it's loyalty through fear. So loyalty through love through lo versus loyalty. Um, through fear. And then the House of Trades, you know, starts out as, as love. It does evolve into something else as this as, as this religious tones take it take over in this novel and this religious uh, this religious myths that were seeded many years, centuries ago start to play out, um, at least be interpreted as far as um, through Paul. So speaking of that, the power of myth. So this is another thing that I've thought about after, after reading this book is this, the power of myth is that the Bene Gesserit order years ago has set up these, planted these little seeds of myth. And so the Fremen that live on, the native people who live on the Arrakis world, you know, they have developed this whole mythology around, around their, you know, their savior, their Messiah. And so, um, Paul understands this because Paul, uh, being a, a son of a Bene Gesserit, he was trained in the Bene Gesserit way. His mother, Lady Jessica, was of that order. And so he was trained in this way. So he has their skills and they have very sharp skills. Like they call it weirding way. And there's this voice thing that they can sort of control people through talking. Um, they have a certain pre pre sort of precognition. But then the spice, of course, adds to this. Um, so Paul can see many avenues into the future he can see like different at one point he like talks about um if he uses one word different the future will go off into a, a different direction so there's many strands of possibilities into the future and paul can see those different possibilities and so to me that was really uh really cool so along those lines about fate versus free will another thing i've thought about after reading this book is that there's a certain amount of fate so fate is the choices that paul's making um you know through the novel but um i mean free will is the choices paul's making through the novel but fate he sees like really Really, there's only one outcome. He's like trying to figure out a way to avoid this outcome that he sees into the that he sees for the future. But you know, it really almost seems like that's fate. However, there's different avenues towards that, and its different severities um, depends on what he does, and that's free will. So free will versus fate, which I thought was pretty cool to think about. So I think I will stop this chat there. Um, I am in the process also of reading book two, which is called Dune Messiah, and I will have a chat on that eventually. But my next chat is actually going to be The Constellation of Philosophy by Boethius, which I have finished. So I ha should have a chat on this coming up fairly soon. So until next time, take care. Bye.